actually, I will bring Mario on stage as well. Um, so I have the complicated name. My name is Shorty Young. I work as evangelist for Unre the Unreal Engine across Europe. So I travel all over Europe. I talk about Unreal in all of its regards, from business to marketing to technical stuff to education to anything that happens. I've been using Unreal for 20 years about now, which is half of my life, which is before I even started using email or anything else. I've been using Unreal already. So that works okay, I guess. Um, and I'm going to talk about two things. But before we do that, I'll hand over the word to Mario first. Hi, my name is Mario Palmero. Uh, I've been a gameplay programmer for a while. I've been working with Unreal for like seven years now. And now I'm going to be the technical evangelist, the same uh, job that Short has, but for Spain, Italy, France, and, and Portugal. So um, anyone that wants to contact me, uh, and, uh, you will, will be seeing me around and on all the fairs and so. So anything, any question that you have regarding real, uh, you can reach me. Okay. Yeah. Good. Um, I'm gonna I'm downloading the presentation because I want to unplug the cable here because my mouse doesn't have enough space. Okay, so that's gonna happen in a second. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna talk for about thirty minutes about this presentation. And again, the mouse is gonna be annoying for you to look at. You can see me stumble with my mouse, uh, but I want to build that. Base, just the environment, because it's actually a cinematic, so the robots are part of the cinematic, but just building the environment to give you a feeling of what it's like to build a level in Unreal, you know, and some of the tools like the material editor, and you can do some texture painting and vertex painting, and some copy pasting with Notepad. Um, and then once we've done that, so that's more introductionary level. Once we've done that, I want to go to what you see over here, which is Hardcore Blueprint. It's a little bit of a long presentation. This is the reduced version at 244 slides. Now that still is too long for 30 minutes, so what I will do is like 10 of those slides, or 12 or 15 or 20 or whatever the number will be. Okay, that's much more hardcore. It's meant hardcore, uh, you know, blueprint as it implies. We're going to talk about uh, performance and hopefully, if the time allows, us, about the casting and the references between blueprinting, the stuff that you should probably know but you don't know it yet. I think probably, because I didn't even know some of it until I started properly looking into this a while back. Um, good. So that finished, and I don't want to open it there. Hold on, I'm just going to fight Windows for a second, because it insists on opening that here, and I want to do that, I want to do this more. And I'm going to unplug an internet cable, and hopefully nothing dies, and we can start. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, and actually, I'm going to plug my mouse in on the other Ooh. side. This might go very bad as well. Okay. Also, the cable is not long enough, it seems. This is really cool. So, totally professional. That's fine. And it lives. Good. Um, right. This thing. So, here's the level we want to build. That's the finished scene. I always start with that. But let's not look at that. Let's just stop, look at nothing. Good. Um, moving the computer, dangerous. Um, who of you is new to Unreal? And new, I mean, you feel new with it. Okay, there's half of you about good. And so the other half are blue uh, are designers. I was told primarily with experience with Unreal. Correct? Yes. They should. Good. Right. Um, let's start really basic, right? Let's start by making a floor. Cool. So here's a cube. Very cool. This took a long time to model. It's really, really hard, this box. Anyway, this is the floor of the level. I'm going to place it on 0, 0, 0, like we've done now. Uh, we'll deal with the material later. Or in fact, let me just apply the material so you can see it. But we're going to make the material better later. So the material of that is a thing called floor. Drag it on top. That's it. Really pretty, as you can see. Totally not repetitive at all. Really good. It has some leaves with moss. Good. Um, then you want to place some more things, right? For example, again, it's a bit slow to move the mouse on the surface here. Uh, sidewalks. So we place sidewalks, reset to zero. I'm using this with Blueprint as well. So I actually made this little Blueprint, which in this case is rather useless, but it places these few building meshes as one. 
In this case, it's a bit more useful. It places all the distance ones as one mesh. And if you were to look at the blueprint, because as you probably know, blueprint is our visual scripting language, as you see here. There is no visual scripting in here. I'm just abusing blueprints as a prefab, basically. See, you have all these different building pieces placed as one. So you can do that too. Okay, so now we've got that. Okay, now I could continue and I could place all the different meshes one by one in here. It's gonna take a while to do that, like an hour or so. So let's not do that and let's be much more efficient. Let's open like Notepad, Control A, Control C, Editor, Control V, cool stuff. Okay. Ooh. So everything in Unreal translates to text. You can see that if you copy something from Unreal, it literally becomes text. Look, if I delete this and I take some random object here, like the road, and I go back, it's literally just text. You can see here it says sidewalk. Okay. So you can be in a, in, in a chat program together and it sends each other stuff. As long as the model is in the, in the project, it's fine. Right? Obviously, it's not going to send the actual model itself. It's only going to send the reference to that. Uh, then I realized I forgot a couple of things, so I had to make more text files. So here's the stuff I forgot. So that's the building. Um, and then we've got like uh, particles I don't need yet. The roads, they were also too difficult to place, too annoying. So here's the roads. Okay. In fact, I'm going to set it to unlit so it's a bit brighter. So what we have now is this. But these are all just individual meshes. I mean, you could have, again, just placed them one by one by hand. It just would have taken a little bit of time. Good. Um, now, it's a little bit empty here, and it's a little bit black in the sky. So let's place a sky. Let's just go here, and we'll just type sky. And we have this mesh here, which is essentially just a little half sphere, hemisphere thing. That is very small. So we'll make that a bit bigger. Here's scale 5,000 or something like that. I typed a lot more than 5,000, 50,000. That, you put a material on there. You got this, you rotate around because the sun has to be somewhere there. You got this. Um, then we want some trees and grass on the side. Right? Um, you can use a foliage tool, which says drop the foliage here. So I guess you kind of get what it wants. So you could go to the, um, to the content browser, find a model, Okay, let's get the sky in here, for example, and then start painting skies. Now, that would work, but it's a bit strange as well, unless it's some kind of multiverse thing. Um, so let's kill that. I already saved some uh, foliage assets in the past to prepare this, if I can actually remember my project, I think here and here. That. So this is different trees and all that, but it's not the model itself. It's actually the model plus a bunch of properties. You can see here's the model but there's a bunch of additional properties attached to it. You can do that too. So it's, for example, it already has the amount, the density and the size of those models are already part of it. So since all the settings have been already set up, still fighting the mouse. Um, I'll just select all of this, drag it in there. Cool, let's just go full screen and paint stuff. Cool. Now it's a bit low density, I've noticed. And oh, I'm really fighting the mouse. So higher density, whoops, not on the road. This is particularly fun to do if you don't fully control your mouse, as you can imagine. Trees. That's a bit much, maybe. I will. Maybe not here. So if you're doing this in production, you probably should do this a little bit better than I'm doing it, okay? Please don't do this at home. Please don't be professionals that do this. Yeah, but for the sake of quickly showing you what happens, it'll work. Um, then what I tend to do, because it's quite a lot of trees, is lower the density and paint the distant ones with lower density, just to kind of fill out the rest of the environment a little bit at least, basically like this. But it's kind of cheap. I mean, again, if this were a real level, you probably don't want this many trees, so you probably want to have done something more intelligently than randomly painting it for one minute. Okay, But again, demo, it'll work. You go there as well. Actually remove some of these a little bit. Good. So now we have this. In fact, I'm just going to kill that one. 
um, I got a bunch of trees, as you can see. The nice thing with foliage, because this is actually rendering as one giant object. You can see if I select it, it's one giant object. It's instance rendering, so it renders very quickly. But you can still select individual ones. I can still go back to the foliage tool, take this tool, for example, the select tool, and take this individual piece of grass and still modify it, rotate it, or in fact, even delete it if I really want to. For example, these flowers are a little bit over the edge, so it could technically literally do this. You can really tweak it to perfection. Okay. Um, now, it's a little bit on the dark side, okay? Just a tiny little bit. Um, so what we want to have is obviously lighting. Also, and you can see, by the way, the floor is going to be very shiny. That's going to be an issue we'll solve later, so ignore that for the time being. But we don't have lighting, so I can go to lights and place uh, a directional light. And this is going to look ugly a little bit, but I'm going to replace it soon with the finished ones. But just to give you an idea, obviously you rotate that thing so you, you can match the sun's direction. You can change the properties, you can make it rather weird like that, I don't know. You can set it up, right? There's a lot of properties here. I'm going to show you the finished results soon with all the properties set up. But that's the basic idea. Thing is, though, that the shadows are still very dark, right? The shadows are pitch black, as you can see here. So there's no atmospheric scattering. There's no light being refracted in the atmosphere of the planet and acting as ambient lighting. So if you were to add a aim, a skylight to the environment, we fix that. So the lighting is done as a combination of a directional light and the skylight. And what the skylight does is it essentially takes a picture of the surrounding geometry, the sky, and it projects the sky as a picture back onto the level as lighting. So the lighting is matching the colors from that the, the sky has in the distance. And that results in this ambient light-like look. Um, you could then continue from that point on, right? You could say, for example, um, I want to have some distance fog. So now you have some distance fog. Let's bump it up a little bit. We've got that kind of effect. You could say, I want to control post-processing. So here's a post-process volume. We're going to say that is unbound, so it affects everything. So that box, it doesn't, you don't only have to be inside the box with a camera. The box always affects the entire world. And once we've done that, we can start tweaking things. So for example, we can set the bloom to some next-gen value and do that. So now it's next-gen. Um, you can do color correction on it and all kinds of other things. For example, let's just say this, you know. Probably not as much, but you can kind of recolor it a little bit. You can you have lots and lots of settings in here that you can work with. And that's the nice part about Unreal that it's so very visual and all of these effects are enabled by default. Even if those boxes are actually disabled there, I mean none of these boxes are on, but they're still they're actually enabled as well. The overrides are off, the setting is enabled. That's a, that's a significant thing to notice. In any case, it would take a while to tweak the 200 numbers that I've just quickly shown, right? Because of the, the numbers in the lights, and the skylights, and the post-processing, the fog, etc. So what I will do is I'm going to delete all of that stuff, including the fog, and I'm going to add a blueprint that has all of those just ready-made in a single blueprint, but with the correct values. And what we've got then is this. So this is now the, the looks we've got in just a few minutes' time. Obviously, this has been prepared, but it goes pretty quickly. This is 100% dynamically lit. There's no baked lighting. It's completely dynamically lit. This should, again, the floor is very shiny. We'll solve that soon. And if you were to look at what this thing is, it's a blueprint. There's nothing in that blueprint in terms of scripting. See, the scripting is empty. But in terms of the viewport, we've got uh, the uh, skylight, uh, sorry, the directional light with some change settings. You can see there's a couple of settings changed here. We've got the skylight, again, with some settings changed. And we've got the fog as well, with actually a cube map blended into it. Which is kind of what you're seeing here. It's kind of a special trick you can do. Doesn't always work, but you can actually blend a cube map into the fog, and then the fog gets different colors. But it can look very strange as well. It really, really depends on the context. And so the end result is this. You can see it gets a bit hazy here, a bit orange color, and the city has a different color, therefore, you know, it kind of look, looks a bit polluted or whatever. Anyway, the floor is a little on the shiny side, right? The floor is actually shiny because of what we've done in the materials. So here is a material editor from Unreal. You can see this is the setup. So it does all kinds of fun stuff. 
I don't really care about that. What I care about is this thing here. It's a material function called ground wetness. If you double click that, you see what ground wetness does. It does that. Um, and we don't really care about that either. All we really care about is the fact that here it says the vertex color channel is that. So it's using vertex color to uh, display or not display the effect. So essentially that thing controls if that's visible or not. So in other words, if you were to paint vertex color on the, onto the mesh of a particular color, I'm just going to do black and white, um, it's going to remove the effect. So if I take this and then I'm going to say select all the meshes, the matching meshes, and then I go to the, um, the texture paint tool, or sorry, the, the mesh paint tool. It says here colors. You can see I can fill this with, for example, black, which would remove the shininess. I can literally do this, and the shininess is gone. If I then paint on top of it again, in fact, I'm going to select these sidewalks as well. Actually, fill them with black too. And if I then paint on top of it with uh, white, you can see what you're getting, see? You get literally puddles. Now, in fact, I think what it expects is a little bit of a yellowish tint for various technical reasons. So I'm just going to quickly fill the whole thing with that. So we get this. You can see that looks better because now everything is a little bit wet. And then I'm going to paint on top of that with proper white for the actual puddles. So you can see there's actual puddles there. There's an actual puddle there. I don't know, something there. I don't know. I'm doing this really quickly. Again, stuff probably needs more attention and love than what I'm doing, but that looks okay, I think. You can probably paint some here too. Stuff. And what we have now is so far this. Uh, there's a couple of other problems. If you look away, you can see, look at the puddle there. If you look down, it loses the reflections. Uh, it loses the reflections because it uses screen space reflections for what you can see. But the moment you look away from the geometry, the screen space reflections can no longer render the reflection of the building, right? Because this would normally show the reflection of the building there, but the, the building there is no longer on screen. So if it's no longer on screen, it can't be shown in the reflection because otherwise it would still have to be on screen. So that's why it's disappearing there and it's falling back on the skylight's reflection. So the skylight also has a cube map. That's just using the general cube map from the sky, which is why you get this bluish color. Now, you could place um, a, ref a sphere reflection capture as a local effect. You can see this is a little thing. It has a range. It's that, that big. And basically, it captures a local cube map at that position, and then it blends that in with the materials if those pixels are within the range, th that orange sphere thing range. You can place a few of those, and again, I'm doing this very quickly. It probably needs a bit more attention. You probably want to change the radius, etc. But just out of example, we now got this. You can see if I look down, it still changes a bit, but at least you see the building somewhat in there, right? And exactly how good it looks depends on the settings and the placement of those of the act. But at least you see some kind of reflection in there, which is that. Um, okay. If we go back to the forest, and let's destroy some trees, unfortunately. Let's do like this. Let's say there should be a road in the forest here. And I did it a little bit white, and it's going to look a bit ugly. But still, there should be a road on the ground. So you want to paint a path into the ground. Now, if you use landscapes or something, that's pretty straightforward. You just select the landscape layer, and you paint on the landscape, and you have a road, right? But this is not a landscape. This is, as you saw in the beginning, a regular mesh. It's just a mesh. Now, you could paint on top of it with vertex colors. But because the mesh is a bit on the big, it's uh, very big, you see you have very few vertices to work with. So that wouldn't work either. So what we're going to do instead is we're going to paint a texture onto the mesh itself. I can go here, where I made a really, really good texture, which is this one. Okay, So I made that. Took four years to do. And that texture, I'm going to add into the material. So here is the material. It's pretty straightforward. You can see you have these are the two textures, and these are the two normal maps that belong there. It uses this thing for the you know where the leaves and the moss are, and that is being projected. I planar map that in the material itself. So the UV projection is generated in the material editor, and then that's used for determining where that's visible or that's visible. That's it. 
So what we want to do here is we want to add that white texture in there. And we want to have a third texture in here as well. Uh, we've got gravel and the gravel normal map. So we want to have these, see? Okay, so there's another lerp, just like we have here, linear interpolate. Um, A is, wait, B is what we already had. A is the new texture. That new texture has the same UV projection as the other two, so that goes there. That also goes for the normal map. The normal map also has another lerp, so what we already had was B. And alpha is um, the white texture, in fact. We got that, so we can just basically take the red channel. It doesn't really matter, just one of the color channels. A is, again, the texture as we had it. That goes to normal, and this goes to base color. And then, for technical reasons, we need to set the white texture to UV coordinate um, 1. So it uses a second UV index. And that's it. There is no difference here. In fact, if I apply this, there is still no difference. It doesn't look different at all, it's the exact same thing. But if I go back to the texture tool, and I go to actually painting textures, I can see all the textures as found in the material of the mesh that I currently have selected, including my white paint texture. So if I go there, and I were to paint black into that texture, maybe I should be able to paint, oh sorry, my bad again. Set the UV channel to 1, just like we did in material. Now if I then paint on top of it, I can literally just paint into it. See, and I get, just like it's a landscape, as if it's a terrain, I can just paint my gravel texture in there. And if I press uh, Approve, there's a little V there, and I go back to my white texture, you can see we just painted... Well, that's kind of hard to see for you, but... Uh, I get there. We painted that. So you can literally paint on the textures itself directly within Unreal and then use that for certain effects or whatever else you want to do. Okay. Close that, close that. I'm going to switch to Blueprint in a few minutes. Um, I want to give you a chance, any requests you have. Do you want me to do anything crazy with this in the last few minutes I have with this environment? Nighttime? I, I I probably don't have a texture for the sky that I imagine. It's probably in the engine itself, I guess, would work. Let's try to let's first try to find the assets for that. Some of these won't work well on that, I think, or I can do that. It's a bit weird. It's just I'm looking random stuff here. Procedural night sky, but I'm not sure if it fits the mesh. Oh, that? Well, yeah. Stars. Okay, you have stars. Um, the fog actually fits with the oranges. But you can see how weird the fog gets if you blend in the... Uh, there's a cube map blended on the fog, which looks a bit strange quickly. But it somewhat works up close. So you get a bit of color variation in there. And then you want to have more nighttime, but actually the light kind of fits by itself almost. But uh, let's still see if we can tweak that a bit. Um, what will we have? Maybe it would be more blue. More blue? I'm just pressing buttons, really. I don't know. It's actually quite okay by itself. It's a bit too yellow, maybe, for this one. That probably should be a bit lighter. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty straightforward, as you can see. Just tweak the numbers a little bit, and we've got night. Anything else? <laughs> the trees are, the trees should be burning. <laughs> you want burning trees? Uh, sorry, what do you want to do with the trees? You want them on fire. You want fire. Fire on the trees. Yes, set fire on the trees. Okay. 
Um, well, I mean, the problem is there's a lot of different materials, but I can take the most prominent tree, which is that big tree, and I forgot which one it is. Hold on, let's see if we can find the tree. And I don't know if this is going to look, it's not going to look nice, but it's going to be yellow. Okay, I'm going to give you yellow, I'm not necessarily going to give you fire. Let me first try to figure out where that material is located. So the material comes from this one, and I assume that both trees are using the same, I hope, the same material. Yes, I believe so. I believe they're both coming from this one. Okay. Hmm. Well, some kind of noisy thing. Let's see if we get the noise. Oh, that looks. That's totally like fire. That's fine. <laughs> yeah. Let's first like make a fiery layer. So let's have this tw two times, and this is gonna be very cheap and simple, but. Two times a panner, and it's going to be scaled and scaled. And uh, and that's like going to be multiplied together, and then we multiply that with a color, and then maybe we multiply that with um, a lerp, and then we maybe take a time and a science is kind of flickering. Sorry, not at the same time. Time and sign. And you want to have a bias scale or something like that. It's going to look very repetitive, though. So. Oh, and maybe more contrast because fire is kind of contrasty. Maybe, I don't know. Let's just try that. Let's preview that as well. And uh, let's connect everything. Actually, let's add another multiply in between here. It says for brightness. Let's say that's number 20, fire. Um, scale, let's say it's uh, four. Still fighting the mouse. Four. Three, three. Let's say that's like one. 0 0.5, 0 0.75. I don't know what I'm typing, I'm just typing stuff. Just so you know. And then we add that together. I don't know, that's a bit weird, but still it's something, okay? But it's a bit soft, so we need a bit more um, No, I don't think I want that. Or maybe this one, maybe. Well, actually, let's just add a color on top. Because um, it's a bit too contrasted, I think. And then that color probably should be a bit lighter version of this. Darker version, sorry. Give it that, and that's going to be too bright. Maybe. I don't know, you get that. I don't know, I just pressed up. Then I have to blend that with the leaves. And I'll move to Blueprint soon, because now we're going to get stuck on doing this. Um, I need some kind of texture that takes it as a blend on top of it. So let's say that is B, I guess. Actually, that could just be zero. That's fine. That could be emissive. No, sorry. That's going to be what it was. No, I don't know. But we'll find out. Probably needs more than this. Is this probably not enough? I mean, I would have to do more. I would have to like make the leaves itself start falling apart. But I'll just for simplicity, I'll stop here. You could continue. You could make light functions as well with flickering lights on there and then kill performance probably by doing that. And it might not be bright enough, it might not glow enough, it's not really glowy. And everything is, is rendering at the same time, so it's now the whole forest is bulging. You would have to connect it to some kind of texture that scrolls over, and that changes the whole thing a bit. In fact, uh, let me just, sorry, let me just quickly do that too. <laughs> In fact, I need the material, I'm just going to copy paste this stuff. This would go faster if it's not for the mouse, okay? So don't blame me, it's the mouse. 
I actually just want to have this one because that's what we want to do. And uh, we want to do like this. And in fact, it says here time. I'm going to do per instance random. Per instance random, which I believe I can probably multiply or add or something to the time, but that might mess up because I never do this, but it might work. So let's see if that works to randomize it a bit. And uh, for this thing, let's take that giant input here and let's drag that into power. And let's say that this should be like 40 or 60, 60 maybe. And let's say that this scale is off. So the scale should be, and I always mix this up. I think it's smaller or bigger, bigger. We'll find out and let's try again. Okay. Soon is blueprint. You asked for fire. I mean, you're getting fire. Well, I mean, it looks more varied. That's cool. It's a bit on the weird side. Now we have that. It's a bit strange, no? It's a bit fast as well, but for five minutes improvisation standing here, I guess it does something. Good. Do you want Blueprint? <laughs> You're gonna laugh less now because now it's hardcore. This was fun. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'm actually gonna do this in two weeks in London. So this is not entirely finished yet, um, as it says here and there. I forgot where it even says that, but it's not finished yet. So I'm still working on this. It's too long, it's two hours minimum. So I'll take the most interesting part out of it. The idea here is that it's about Blueprint in-depth, as you can see here, which means that it's about giving you in-depth insight and knowledge of Blueprint beyond the usual feature level or the level, and a visual guide with many tips for using Blueprint in a proper and advised way. So basically, how, not, how to use Blueprint correctly. That's the main idea. Because by doing so, you know, let me try, get to nice pictures, right? Nice pictures are like that. By doing so, you hopefully don't get that. Or you don't get this, and I really like, you have to look in the details, right? This line here is very nice, because it actually keeps on going until here, so who knows where that goes? Um, and if you've got like that, don't do the copy-paste thing. Or that's nice too. That, I mean, that, that's actually reasonable relative to the previous ones. It's not good, but okay. You can put it in frames, and I like the curl here, <laughs> where you have like that. That's really artistic. You know, so. um, but the idea is to do Blueprint a bit better than that, okay? Um, and for the artists of you or the people who are new to Unreal, I think Blueprint is really, really important, obviously in the engine, not just for gameplay or anything like that. Everyone should know Blueprint. Everyone, okay? Because you can use Blueprint also for um, uh, artist stuff, um, for making small tools, for just, in general, you should just understand. It's a vital part of the engine. Now, most of this is too advanced for the artist, though. I mean, this, this goes beyond the usual level. So what I'm going to do, but it still gives you interesting background. So I'm going to go to what I think is the most interesting to begin with. I have really cool stuff in here, by the way. Here's a picture of a Swedish door. I live in Sweden. That's a Swedish door. That aside, I want to talk about performance. Oh, well, that's the most important part. So, um, and I'll skip a number of slides. If I feel that I want to skip, you know, for the sake of time, skip forward, I'm going to skip a few slides. I'm going to skip that. I'm going to talk about runtime performance. Now, Blueprint is slower than C++, but it's not necessarily slow. Uh, for the great majority of cases, Blueprint is perfectly fine. It really depends on what you do and how you do it. Um, on a typical computer, in a typical project, Blueprint holds up very well for most things. Uh, and the most common reason for moving things over to C++ are usually actually more workflow and collaboration and performance. But there's exceptions, but in general. Okay. Um, in general, when you give special attention to Blueprint is when it involves a large number of actors that have to update all the time. Let's say you make a real-time strategy game with 10,000 soldiers, maybe that's not Blueprint, okay? Um, when working on hardware with a weak CPU, some consoles depend on the game, but especially mobile or uh, you know, anything like that, and anything that has extensive and frequent loops of logic. That's the basic idea. Now, to really make this easy for you, and I know I have, I have quite a bit of text in here, 
I'm going to skip forward to working mostly with the images I have, yeah? There's a number of reasons it's slow. Uh, the first reason is actually, sorry, this doesn't have an Im a picture. You get a picture soon, okay, picture. Um, the reason number one is actually the biggest performance loss from Blueprint comes from executing large networks. It's the connection between nodes themselves that are expensive. So when you execute Blueprint, it's not what the Blueprint does. It's the connection between nodes that has a bigger impact than the rest. For that reason, they often say that logic and math, mod, I can never know how to pronounce that, is bad in Blueprint. Basically, if you've got this thing, where you've got an event, you know, two events, that does print string, that does a linear trace for objects. This is obviously way more complicated than print string. But in terms of Blueprint performance, these are identical. In terms of actual performance, this is heavier, because this is more complicated. But Blueprints, the loss from Blueprints is here, the connection between the two. So that's where the performance loss really goes. Um, and for the re this is related to it. The second and the next reason why Blueprint is heavy is because of anything with quick loops. Because a quick loop is probably going to go through the connections rapidly, right? You've got a quick loop, so it's going to go round and round logic. So it does connection, 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 connection. You can see how this is going to go. So that's also expensive. Um, anything that requires iteration of a large number of actors is expensive. Please don't do get all actors of class all the time, for example. Um, and then ticking in general is also more expensive in Blueprint and C++. And usually abuse of ticking is the most common cause of performance loss. And I have a couple of examples, I think, in a few slides. Um, oh yeah, Blueprint has a 250k instruction limit. I think you can raise this somewhere. If you go above it, the game will error out. But if you go above it, you, the problem is probably you. Um, I'll skip that, I'll skip that. Uh, actually, no, I'm not going to skip this one. Blueprint is also the performance of Blueprint and the performance of Unreal in general depends greatly on where you're looking at it. If you do the Pi, the play and editor, that's completely different than shipping, like packaging the game and then running the game in shipping, as we call it. And it's different also than dev play, which means to run the game but without running the editor. Okay? So you don't package the game, you just run the game but without running the editor and without packaging it. In fact, if you, you can build a test case, and this is all theoretical, but it gives an idea of what Blueprint would do in an actual project. So I built this test case where I have this completely useless thing calculation running that just gets set to a variable, and it's going to loop that a great number of times. So we've tried doing that with huge number of iterations using the profiler, and what we then got in our test case was this. So you can see that is C++ doing the same thing. That's Blueprint a bit of a difference. But this is in, in the editor. It's play in editor. If you look at this, in non-editor, it changes. Okay, So C++ is actually missing here, but C++ was nearly at the bottom, right? So at the bottom, you would have C++. That line is blueprint in shipping. That line is blueprint in the editor. A slight difference. So at that point, blueprint would have still been more expensive than C++ right here at the bottom. But the difference is not huge anymore. Now, this was a very theoretical test where it just loops through an, a, a useless calculation. So you now, in real life, it's probably going to be a little bit different. But it gives you an idea of the difference between it. And you can see the yellow line is running the game without packaging it, but without editor. You can see the impact of the editor compared to just running the game itself. It's huge. Uh, now, in terms of ticking, which is, again, the most common thing, um, the ticking is the per frame updating, right? And it should be used with care. Ticking, I mean, you've got the actual event, right? Called event tick. It's always in Blueprint. That's obviously ticking. But a timeline ticks as well. Mouse X or one of those input things ticks as well. In fact, um, animation Blueprints are ticking. Um, get text, like if you do bind, bind, uh, what do you call it? Bind text or bind variable, whatever it was called, in a UMG widget, that's ticking, and so on. There's a lot of things that are ticking. Now, the best advice is simply limit the use of ticking. But let's say you don't want to do that. You do want to have some ticking. Then there's a number of things you can do. You can do almost everything with timers. So please don't use tick unless you really, really have to. If you can do it with a timer, so loop something on a timer so it doesn't update every frame, it's going to update in slower steps. That's going to be better. In fact, you can add a random float to the timer so that every instance of that actor has a different loop range. It's slightly, slightly different. Because if you don't do that, all the actors are going to loop on the exact same point, right? So all of them update, all of them update, all of them update. It's much better to then update this one, then update that one, then update that one, 
So distribute to load. Obviously, work event-based if you can do it. Um, in UMG, it's common. If in UMG you bind text to something right here, it says you know the player health is the health of the player, so it receives a variable. This gets set all the time. But if you make it event-based, where instead of using the bind function, because that's a bind function, you use an event, and then the event only sets that text when the health actually updates, that's much faster. You can do other things as well. You can do uh, distance checks on ticking. There is, uh, for example, you can do get distance to from the player to the blueprint we're dealing with. And if that distance is uh, less than 5,000, then ticking is allowed. So you can disable the ticking entirely unless the player is closer. You can turn off the ticking, as just mentioned. It's just in the properties. It says tick enabled, yes, no. And you can reduce the trick, tick trick, you can see, on distance as well. You can use the get distance to the same thing, but then scale that value, right? So it says the further away you go, the slower the thing starts updating. So basically the frame rate, if you want to put it simply, of that thing is going to go slower and slower the further away it goes from you. So it, has less, uh, it needs to do less effort in updating it. When you face away, you can do the same thing. There's a function called was recently rendered that allows you to figure out if a, uh, an actor or a mesh has recently been seen. Did you see it or not? which means you can slow down or disable the ticking if you're not actually looking at it. So there's a lot of these small little tricks you can do. Um, often the very visual effects are not that heavy and could be split off. I had this ocean here in my game, which I did in a bad way, and the ocean has rising tides. So it's an island, so you can see the island's a little bit small and the ocean is a bit big, and the entire ocean has a giant volume and the giant volume has to go up and down because the volume says, I am water, and it's rising tides. So the whole thing goes up. But as the volume is going up, it does overlap checks on like everything, which is a little bit heavy for the performance. Um, so since that was the heaviest thing to do on per tick, what I did is I took the volumes away from that. Um, so you can see here I had set actor location. So it would take the volume which is, I think this one, this was the volume. So the volume gets a new location set based on the tight uh, variable, and it would do it per tick. But instead of doing this per tick, I put that on a timer while the visual effects this. So setting a number of, um, of uh, uh, material parameter collection stuff, affecting the waves and how the waves look, and I forgot what that one was. I can't remember what that one was, but it was some kind of particles, I think, just so raising the particles up and down. That's still set per tick, because doing that is not that heavy, but the volume is, so you can always split it into. Um, you can also sometimes think, move things away from tick and just do it entirely visual. In fact, I have actually a project here that I mostly forgot, and I have to restudy this, but this is the example project that goes along with it. Um, let's see if I can remember, where you can, I can show you how this works. So for example here, um, instead of doing a material ticking, you can do the material also entirely in here. You can see normally what would happen is you would take this variable, and the variable in this case blends between red and, and green, and then you would do something like this on begin play. It takes a static mesh, it creates a dynamic material instance from that, and then it plays a timeline where the timeline animates the value of that float. But this one is again ticking, right? Now, in this case, that's not a performance loss. It's for simple usage cases, it's fine. But in a very big game, in a complete production, eventually this might be an issue. Instead of doing that, you can also just do this one. You only create a material instance because the material instance is then going to use this one. It's going to use the time itself and it's going to animate it by itself entirely using the pixel shader. So again, if you can move things over to the GPU instead of the CPU, it's usually fast, and you can see here how that works. See, if I move the cube in, and I say it should use a parameter, and I play that, it goes from red to green. If I disable use parameter, it's using the alternative path, and that looks exactly the same. But one uses blueprint, the other one doesn't really use blueprint. Okay. So again, experiment a little bit with that. Um, and then what I will do is talk a little bit about memory as well.
because they give some interesting insight in what's happening there. And that, let's see if I can find that back. Compilation, which is essentially it. Let's see where we are. I'm gonna skip some of this stuff. And this, I'm gonna go to the casting itself, the implication of that. Okay, so basically this. This is a really important lesson of Blueprint that many people only realize after a few years. I, it took me a few years to realize as well, in fact. Um, blueprints, and you know, I call this casting, but the proper name would be the referencing. How does one Blueprint reference another Blueprint, and what does that mean for the compilation times? But not just for that, what does that mean for your memory and lots of other problems? Um, if you've got a Blueprint, and it costs something else, let's go to this picture first. What we've got here makes this blueprint a lot slower. We've got on begin, event begin play, and then it costs, and it costs to a certain class, right? Because it says that object should be cast to that, and then it does something. This doesn't even work. That is empty, and that does cost failed, and there's nothing coming out here. This is completely useless, yeah? But that will compile. If I press compile on that blueprint, it takes 30 seconds, because that 30 seconds takes that one as well. It takes the other blueprint, which is huge, and then starts compiling that too. Also, memory-wise, if this is loaded in memory, this one is loaded as well. A really important lesson of Blueprint is that Blueprint differs fundamentally from C++ and that C++ is not content. Blueprint is. And content means that content is only loaded when it's required, right? When you start a game, you're not going to load a texture that's not actually in use. Blueprint is the same. You will only load a Blueprint that's actually required by what you're about to do. So because C++ is not like that, when you have a C++ library, it's going to load the entire thing the moment the game starts. It's completely different. Blueprint, you only load when you need it. But if you have one Blueprint that has a reference to another Blueprint, which is what we have here, you get this, right? Let's say there's a Blueprint called Interactive Item, which has a reference to a door, because that makes sense, because maybe the, the Interactive Item is like a key or something, and the key has to tell the door, I open you. Then the door has to tell an alarm that it should go off, so there's a link between them. And then the alarm will tell a button that it, the button can be pressed to turn off the alarm or something. And then the button tells the, the hut and the player, and then that one tells that, and then you can see how this is going to go. Which means if you compile this one, you also compile all of that. If you load the interactive item into memory, you also load all of that. That is a really major lesson. You have to consider what is actually referenced, because you will lose the compile times. In a big project, you can get two, three, four minutes of compile times with Blueprint. Which means that if you press the play button in, in the editor, it takes four minutes. It's not pleasant. You know, you want to play your game, you want to test. And it affects the memory. And in fact, it can affect the memory hugely. I have a picture here. Let me just show you the picture because it shows you what we've got. I just forgot where the picture is. But there's a picture here somewhere I want to have. But it seems a little bit further away than I hoped. Oh, come on. Hold on. We'll get there at some point in time. Oh, this one. I did that. Okay, shows you the idea as well. Because I figured, um, I made a game, and in the game you had a number of items. So there's like a rock, there's a pipe, and I don't know, there's like three or four basic items. So I figured if I make a single blueprint that I call item, it's the items I can carry. And in my game, I only have four things or something. So what I will do is I will make one blueprint, and the one blueprint then executes this function, which says, sets variables or something, and that just says, is it attachable, no, the temperature, you know, some properties. So what I would have is I would have this function four times. This is what happens if it's a rock, this is what happens if it's a pipe, this is what happens when it's a plant, and this is what happens if it's a can, okay? And I figured that'll be fine, right? It'll be okay. Until you realize that maybe I want to have many, many more things in my game than four items, it got a little bit out of hand. And because of doing that, it means that each of these is referencing a model and particles. Because it says, if it's a can, this model, this material. If it's a rock, this model, this material. So all of that content is in here now. Which means that if you look on the, um, the size map, which is in the right click menu, this now says, item standard is at least 1.1 gigabyte. I like that it says at least. So I have no idea how much it actually is. Essentially, if you load the item blueprint, it loads the entire game. Because, I mean, it loads at least 1.1 gigabyte of, of data coming in. That is because of the references. 
The references don't just go between blueprints with casting, they also go to content. So if you've got a mesh in a blueprint, if you say set mesh, and then here's the, the part to the mesh, that mesh is now gonna be loaded when the blueprint is loaded, okay? If you do set particle, that particle will come along when the blueprint is loaded. That particle in turn takes in materials and those take in textures. So all of that comes along if you load that blueprint. And if you then go back to the situation we just had, you can, might be here as well somewhere. No, oh, sorry, skipping forward again. So you can see, if you then go forward to this again, where everything references everything, that in turn brings in all the content. So you got a few gigabytes of data coming in just for loading one blueprint. So be careful with that. Um, it's not just casting, any form of reference does it. You can see if we do new variable, get class, and we compare the class, that too has the same effect. That compiles in 30 seconds, just that little thing there. Let's see if I should stop on this or how we can go through this, because this is quite a lot here. Let me just take a look. Basically, this is the advice on how to do casting correctly, but essentially, you want to have a strategy for what kind of casting you want to do. There's this one overview picture I have in here. It's kind of like this. If you cast or reference in any way from a blueprint from a blueprint that is occasionally present, like a door or something, it's reasonably okay. To the player, it's reasonably okay. But never cast from the player to the button. Because then that means the button is always in memory. The blueprint and all the art. Now, this is quite difficult to do in 30 minutes and give you the solutions to the problems I just explained. So now you know the problems, you don't know how to solve it, but at least you know the problems, okay? Um, the, I can give you a very quick overview and round up there with the actual solutions. The actual solutions would be A, have a strategy in place for where you want to cast. Okay, B, B, just think about it, don't just do it. Think about it, what kind of implications is it going to have if I make this thing reference that thing? That's one thing. Another thing you can do is, I'll just skip back and forth here between classes is basically use more C++. This is how I should have done it. I, instead of having just one item blueprint, I should have had a parent class, that's the parent blueprint, with the children classes underneath. Those hold the references to, for example, the meshes, the particles, etc., but not the, mass, the, the parent. Because when I load a pipe, I only load this one. This is then the pipe. And the pipe then loads to the different uh, uh, content assets. But by loading the pipe, I don't load this one or that one or the other ones. That would have been much better than putting everything there. So using the hierarchy, and then on top of that you got C++, using the hierarchy gives much better results. And it takes some thought there. Um, I think. Let me just very quickly see if there's anything particular I want to highlight. But again, there's a lot of things here to talk about. As you can see, I have to fix this up if I have quite a bit of text, but so this is going to go online at some point as well. We don't know when yet, but when it's ready, we're going to talk about putting this online and making sure this is accessible to everyone. Good. This is quite a lot for you to take in probably on full speed with randomly jumping slides. Do you have any questions or particular things you want to say? So people are laughing a lot less now than fiery trees, but uh, <laughs> you'll take a microphone. Hi. Hey, could you show us how to optimize a, a light function? Because for example, in one scene, if you have uh, lots of uh, light functions, the, it, it, it will go really bad. So it's one way or something to make it better. Okay, light functions. Um, hold on, I'll just make something very basic. There is not really that much to say, though, even though I'm making the example here. Uh, primarily, it comes down to the complexity of the material and the distance it's rendered at. So that's just what I'm going to show. Uh, sorry. 
it's something red. Uh, there is a property here that says uh, the range that is visible in. Might it might only use the the texture? Yeah, I know. Okay. And it's uh, it's not a spotlight, so it's going to be nicely wrapped in strange ways, but it's details. Let me let me rotate that so it's at least a little bit more visible, hopefully. And I'm, at this point, I no longer know why I'm actually building this because I can just explain you what to click instead of building the example. But we're committed now, so we're going to continue. Anyway, it does that. Um, so there's a property here that's called um, the fate range. So basically, work with that is by default set to two thousand, uh, ten thousand, I think. But you want to set that to a lot more, so basically it just fades out. That's one big thing. And then secondly, it's simply the complexity of the material. So this is very simple. If you do something that's more complicated, it's obviously less simple. So it's just those two things. There's not much more to say in general other than that. I um, I got uh, one very specific uh, um, doubt. Um, it's all about uh, reflections in the first uh, first person uh, character mode. Mm -hmm. So could you make uh, actually a reflection of the character, not only the the arms as they are shown in the model? I mean, when you, for example, look in a mirror on in your own reflection, uh, could you actually what's um, mesh of a full character instead of only a couple of arms. Yeah, I mean, let's see if you have any input. I think the normal way is to actually have the entire body included. Do you want to the microphone? One more. Just turn it on, I think. Hi. Uh, the camera has a setting that you can put a use that is Ignore, render, uh, ignore some yeah. characters and also render only some characters. So you can, if you use a render target to, for example, in a mirror, uh, um, um, a camera opposed opposed in the character, you can then select only to render it or, or render other objects and, and not render the arm, for example. You can play with that, but other than that, basically. I think, yeah. Yeah. I think, yeah. Well, you can hold it. <laughs> so I can give you work. <laughs> okay. And not from the end, Jane, but I want to know your opinion in something. Uh, uh, how is the, uh, the experience or the, <coughs> or the feedback from the beginner part of Unreal Engine? I mean, uh, when someone starts to use blueprints, uh, they feel that it's CC or they have a lot of documentation to work, uh, or is just uh, too difficult for them to continue? So basically, the question is how easy is it to get started with Unreal, in particular from Blueprint? Um, I mean, I'm biased and I have a different background. You know, I've never gone to the point I had to learn Blueprint coming from the standard person's background. Mm -hmm. um, I think personally that Blueprint is really easy. Look, I can't program whatsoever. I cannot literally touch a line of code. Well, I've learned some basic HLSL code. Maybe that counts, like one line. I can do plus in there. Um, so that's my level of skill when it comes to program. You give me Blueprint, I made my entire own game commercially, released it. Uh, it sold 200,000 copies, and I can build all of the other stuff. You know, So from that perspective, I wouldn't say the Blueprint is hard. Now, it is a bit different, which might create a bit of a, a, an obstacle, because well, that's different. What does all of this mean? In general, I would say at the um, Unreal is easy in a way, but on the other hand, when you're a beginner, it's a bit intimidating because it has so much stuff in there, so many different tools, features, and you have to understand the Unreal way to work with that. If you compare that to Unity, if you want to take the, the elephant in the room or whatever, um, I think Unity starts a bit more empty. You start with a more simple, smaller engine, and then you've got to extend that. So basically, if you look at their difficulty curve, it would be low in the beginning because there isn't that much to work with. 
And then it gets higher and higher because you realize, I don't have that, I have to build that, I don't have that, I have onto that. And it goes like that. Unreal is more like, shit, there's all of that. And once you're through that, then it's much more stable because once you've learned that, you can do a lot. You can see how quickly I can just do random things if you know what to do. That, mm. It's just a different approach. Okay. Thank you. Any more questions? You can also ask in Spanish, by the way. So don't feel afraid of English. You know, Mario can translate to me. Pues casi que me haces un favor en esto. <laughs> you just asked in English before. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know, but uh, here I'm going to go to the, the blending uh, animations part, and it's bastante más difícil en, en inglés, <laughs> yo creo. Okay, go, go, go. Uh, nosotros que somos cuarto, somos de cuarto y estamos haciendo un juego en tercera persona con cámara libre, estamos teniendo dificultades con el tema de blending de animaciones y sobre todo en implementar lo que es la parte de físicas dentro de ese blending o cómo, cómo se blendean entre las dos cosas. Eh, incluso el apartado de físicas como tal dentro del motor, si lo podéis enseñar un poquito o trazar ligeras líneas de... <risa> ya, ya, esa es la cara que se me queda a mí cuando <risa> tengo que verlo. Eh, en... Pero, no sé, aportar un poquillo de luz sobre okay. el tema. Uh, so, he's asking how to blend physical animation and animation. <laughs> your project. <laughs> That's his project, in fact. But uh, he wants some uh, live demonstration of that. Oh, you mean in this fact. one? Oh, you, you're going to get a microphone then. Wait, it's loading as well. So there are four, um, four, four developers team that uh, they're um, having some issues uh, making that work properly. Are you using your own character? Yeah. Okay, so uh, have you first uh, set it up properly with the character, or is it the problem in... <laughs> <laughs> you can... You know what? You can place two of them. Wait. Yeah, I can hold uh, yeah. them. Uh, because... Uh, oh, wait. Mm. Yeah, let's just... You have to enable you can, the you can, you can physics. Go and hug them. But, uh, oh, yeah, right. So, uh, anyways, um, the main question is how do you set up the uh, the asset if it's proper? Because uh, what kind of what kind of issues do you have? Maybe what what, what happens? What what's wrong? Oh. You can you just don't know how to set it up, or something is wrong? Uh, uh, we have a little problem. In for example, we have a hair that is uh, physically free. So uh, we have problems to set up it because uh, it doesn't go like physically okay. It's just like rigid. Okay, so you want to know how to set up, for example, that one hand is just... Yeah, for example, running. yeah. Okay, uh, you can you <laughs> Okay, uh, I should, I should uh, be able to quickly demonstrate it. Uh, first of all, the, 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 the first thing is you need to have set up the bodies correctly, okay? So you can see that when I select one body, uh, do you, do you, are you familiar with this editor at all? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so uh, for uh, all the others, uh, they, uh, there are bodies connected to bones. So if I display bones, uh, where are the bones? Yep, all hierarchy. So you can see that some of the bones have bodies uh, which are physical colliders uh, connected to them. And you can see that, first of all, uh, all the adjacent bodies are grayed out in here, and it's because you can see that they don't have collision with each other, right? So if they are neighbors, they shouldn't collide with each other, because first of all, if, if I would say that you guys please do collide and try to simulate, it will do, okay, let's maybe simulate from uh, from the selected bone. Yep, it doesn't work as expected. Uh, oh, all right, wait, sorry. Let's do this. Uh, where are we? Yep. 
that simulate this. Okay, so the, the hand is basically fighting with with the. Uh, I might show you this because I, I would need to set it up. <laughs> okay, you can see that the hand wants to get out, right? <laughs> because it's colliding. Yeah, and this is the, the, the whole motion is happening because the hand wants to go out of the body. Uh, because they are colliding and they don't want to be inside each other. And uh, so that's why if they are overlapping themselves, you don't want them to collide first of all. This is the first thing you want to, you want to set. So uh, if you're setting your asset, remember about that. Uh, Okay, and now <coughs> uh, you need to basically set some physical profile and to set it up uh, you want to go to window and then profiles which is actually here already open and you need to set up a profile you, uh, you, and just name it as you wish. Uh, profile. It's okay. And then select the, bo select the bodies that you want to assign the profile to. So for example, it's your hair. Right, and click assign, and then when you do it, uh, you can see that there. Oh wait, where is it? We treat uh, our hair like a socket inside the skeleton. I'm on, here. Only socket. <laughs> what? Only socket. Yeah, yeah. We like we implement so. a little socket in a in the head in the bone of oh, the so head. Oh, so you don't have a separate skeletal mesh for yeah, the hair. Yeah, separately and very so simple. So you should have the hair as a skeletal mesh first of all, because it will help you simulate the physics properly. Oh, okay. Because el uh, else you would need to create some constraints. Yeah, I created. it. Yeah, but how does the hair look like then? Crazy. <laughs> it's, it's, it's just a, but is it just a mesh, a static mesh? It's a skeletal mesh. Okay, so it's a skeletal mesh. So you can plug in the hair to Right? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. You, you just uh, attach skeletal mesh to a yeah, skeletal yeah, yeah, mesh. Yeah, yeah. That's I, fine. Yeah. So just what you want to do is set all the bodies of the hair mm -hmm. to uh, physics type uh, simulated. Oh, okay. Like you, you, can, you can set it to default and then set uh, the profile in the code. For but, example. Uh, let's, you can go with simulated here mm -hmm. and then set up some values like, I don't know, uh, let's say 1000, 100, 1000, 100. <laughs> Zero zero, and you should just figure out themselves, uh, them yourself, um, and uh, and then uh, if you would simulate only only this hand, it should just work as as I want it, and then I can just lower the values, uh, and you know and have it a bit less stiff, and it should already work like that uh, in the editor, uh, like uh, in the game. If not, you would need to. Uh, Enable it to simulate physics. Yeah, uh, the the mesh. For example, in our hair, we have like the first bone is a kinematic one, mm -hmm. and the the others ones are like free. Yeah, and I set it in the blueprint uh, of the character, yeah. like, and then they don't simulate it. I don't know why, but <laughs> you set yeah, them as. Well, uh, could you repeat? Uh, you s you set them in. In the blueprint, you yeah, attach yeah, yeah. it, and yeah. it does. It doesn't simulate. Yeah. And you set, you selected them to be simulated. Okay. No. Right. Uh, the first one is kinematic, and the other ones are default. default. Okay. So default will do. So like, they won't be simulated if you don't enable simulation. But uh, but uh, then you can just select them as simulated if you want them to simulate all the time. I if you set default, then you can switch between uh, modes. Oh. Uh, in the editor to do, uh, to achieve the effect as well. I will try. So so play with those values, play with them, and I guess that you can also. Uh, no, okay, it's it's not the proper one. Yeah, this this guy just just simulates physics, and it's all. So this character that is wiggling around. No, this is not the one. This is the one. Um. With those with those parameters set here, so you set all bodies simulate physics, and then if they're set to kinematic, they won't. All right. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Any other questions? I I have one question, a bit off topic, about the new Niagara system. Uh, if I'm working in Cascade. And I want to port my my project to Niagara. Is that possible, or I should 
after I start over or some part of it is portable. You mean if you already have particles? Yes, I have in particle cascade. system in cascade and I want to um, right use it uh, in Niagara. Right now, no. We are looking at some kind of conversion tool, but that's not finished. I don't think we even started, and therefore I can't say what it exactly will do, if it even makes it, and when it's released. But we are un we, we understand the need, so it'll probably happen at some point. Right now, the best thing you can do is just manually copy it. So the, as the, if you learn the basis of, basics of Niagara, you are good enough to just manually, you know, this number here, that number there, this number there, and just go manually back and forth. Because most of that stuff is kind of similar in both. It's just different places. The names might be a bit different. There's a few things that might need a bit more attention, like what is you know, uh, velocity from from location or something, whatever it was called. Like when you know that's has, that's a completely different setup. I think you have to multiply with uh, a variable you get or something in was. But I mean, if you get through a couple of those basic pain points and and conversion points, the rest is actually pretty simple. So I would do it like that for the time being. Niagara is still in an experimental state. It's not 100% there yet. It'll probably take one to two more releases before it's really completely there. So, I mean, take it easy as well. Don't convert everything and then realize, oh, <laughs> it crashes a lot or this is broken and then you're stuck. Okay. Also, I don't think you need to convert them if you already have working particles for now. Yeah, the, the two it's systems it's are going to right? coexist for a long time. At some point, we'll remove Cascade. I don't know when it is. It might be a year from now, more than that. I don't know, but it's going to be a while. Uh, Niagara is faster in rendering, at least faster in CPU simulation than uh, Cascades. So if you have a very complex particle system, that one might actually be beneficial to move over. But usually, no, it's uh, no. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to ask to um, um, do you use when you do a game or a level? Uh, do you use uh, a tile set um, with textures with the units, uh, or you use just uh, do the white box, or yeah. you just do the uh, directly the white box? Right. So, do I use a texture that has the sizes on it, or just white box? Yeah, it, a tile set. Oh, um. I don't know, whatever. I mean, I'm not your usual case. I just do stuff and it works out. But that's because if you have experience, you can do that because by experience, it will just work out. <laughs> so I'm not your usual case. If I were in production, I guess if you're going to use a texture anyway, you might as well use one that has the actual sizes on it. But if you do that, then you do have to be careful the sizes are actually correctly scaled. And then you might have to set up a material function in the material that always scales the material to the exact same size. And I mean, it gets more complex. So personally, what I do is I, uh, I would do mock-up models in Max or Maya or something with the right sizes, and I use those primarily as my reference points. Like, this is about a character, this is a chair, this is, I don't know, whatever normal objects you've got. And then based on that, the other things I would measure or simply guess and estimate based on what feels right, depending on the, need, the, the nature of the project. Okay, so oh. uh, for experienced people, it's not useful. Anymore. It might. It depends on the project as well. It depends on the team. If you're working alone, it's different than if you're working in a hundred people team. You know, it depends on so many factors. If the the bottom line is, if it's useful for you, you use it. If it's not, then you don't. But that's basically the best advice, I think. That goes for most solutions. All of the things and all of the tools you've got are just tools to get to the end result. You know, never should the process be more important than the result. The result always overrules the process. So use whatever works for you. And that's compatible with your team members and other requirements. And provided you can do that, then sure. This is a very complicated political answer, but that's basically the point. <laughs> OK, thank you. Yeah, your requirements is use metrics or you fail. OK. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, sorry if the question is to, to noob. Uh, but I couldn't find how to make a loop with delays. With, de with delay? You shouldn't do that really, but... <laughs> <laughs> but, okay, so, uh, you, I mean, this is basically cheating. So you can, for example, say delay. Let's say, let's add here 
could you please <laughs> thank you yeah and then you can set some branch that will count for example like i don't know uh integer greater than integer like uh, as long as you uh, okay yes let, uh, I mean, does that come from tick where does that come from i mean i don't mind no. right now okay. but it sh you should start it with an <laughs> event it's begin play. okay begin play so it's from the begin play so this is like uh, let's promote it uh, it's really hard to operate this mouse yeah, yeah i told you <laughs> yeah uh, let's call it count then this count is like i don't know uh, let's say 10 and then um yeah maybe it's the delay let's call it after and if this they said it properly if the count is less than 10 then you go here and uh oh no no, no not this one and increment the integer uh, and then you go back here. Yeah, so don't do this. <laughs> don't do this. <laughs> but you technically can. So let's print <laughs> something here. And it should kind of work. Uh, yeah, let's maybe print the count. Uh, how to? OK, yeah, good. Oh, wait. Okay. Do yeah. it work as, as intended? <laughs> But don't do that. Like ne never, never try to overuse yeah. blueprints. I mean, it's useful in some cases, but please better try to like use the uh, like uh, timers. Just use a timer. Yeah, yeah. use a timer. Like wait, let's hide it because it's it's wrong. It's <laughs> don't take pictures, please. <laughs> Bad example. Hello again. Uh, a quick question. When using blueprints, would you recommend using functions or custom events? Performance wise. Um, functions are probably slightly faster, I guess, but in terms of compilation, I would say. I guess but not in terms of runtime performance. I'm pretty sure it doesn't so, matter. No. The, the main difference between function and the, the event is that function can return value and the event cannot. And also, in, in events, you can do some weird stuff like delays. And, and and others. Well, the, compil you shouldn't abuse. the compilation is slightly faster with functions than with events. Like run so, time, not runtime now. Thank you. Ultima Hello again. Um, I've been trying to play with uh, some Paragon assets of the characters, and I was wondering if there's a way to optimize and implement, uh, for example, one of the messes, the characters in that uh, program, uh, Physics. I mean, if there's a, sim a simple way uh, to uh, modify the character controller, the animation, the animation controller, for example, the legs, uh, the way, the, the weapon, the character, uh, in order to make uh, another animation for the of a character. Ah. In in Spanish, I mean. Uh, sí, Mario. Sí, yeah. Uh, con un personaje del Paragon, utilizar el el solo el modelo pero cambiar el, el controlador de la animación a su vez, por ejemplo, para eliminar el arma y hacer que utilizar ese asset, como por ejemplo para un personaje, para go, con otro fin, por ejemplo, que no sea un shooter. So you want to remove the model and use the anim blueprint for another character? No. no. Keep the model. Keep the model, okay. Yes, and change the anim controller. Remove the weapon, for example. When, when you say anime controller, uh, you mean the blueprint controller or the anime blueprint? Anime blueprint. Anime blueprint. Okay, yeah. So, on. so you, you want to uh, keep the model and change the anime blueprint to use it on, on another character? You mean? Well, uh, for using um, the anime blueprint to another character, you can retarget uh, 
and in blueprints. You probably know that you can retarget animations, so you play an animation in, into another character, for example. But not only you can all, uh, you can retarget uh, animations, you also can retarget the whole anim blueprint in the same way. It's more or less the same system. So this anim blueprint from, from Paragon can be used in in other characters. It's going to fail at compile time, but all the stuff, all the graphs, are going to be the same. Is that what you meant? Uh, more or less. Um, I was wondering more about all the DMS, all the models, with the code, for example, and with the GAN, and remove the GAN, for example, in this case. To, to remove the GAN, as far as I played with Paragon assets, the GAN, for example, or, uh, the sort of Greystone, I think it, it's attached to the skeletal mesh. So you have to go to uh, to go to FDX, remove the the sword, and then reimport again. And probably you're going to do some. Well, something. you can assign it. It, 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 it was that the, <laughs> the question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. it was. It was. Uh, or you can. You can assign an invisible <laughs> material to the mesh, <laughs> but don't do that either. No, but the problem, for example, is the several assets yes. shared ID. Okay. For example, in Greece, the, the, the sword is actually shared. Okay. Sword, well, you can paint it. alpha in the texture that makes up the sword. No, don't do any of this. I guess you can hmm. set zero scale for a bone, but it also would hide it. But don't. I don't think it's a good idea. We're giving you a lot of bad tips here, yeah, so just no, don't listen to us. It's not a good idea. <laughs> I wasn't explaining uh, very good either. Hmm. So. <laughs> You can repeat the question if you want. No, no, it's okay. I, uh, you answer it. Okay. okay. Good. It, it was that. Thank you. <laughs> Any other question? Hi. Hi. I was wondering if, like, after all the technical questions, if you could show us any of your artistry work or final results, so for the people that haven't used the program can see what we can do with the program. Personal things. Um, I, I could, but it's going to take a, a few minutes to load, actually, if I load something. So I'm not sure how it's going to go. And the laptop is new, so it might do shader compiles. I'll try, okay? So I'll start something and then we'll wait a few, if I can even find it back on my computer. Meanwhile, do you have another question? Yeah. Yeah. Over there. Uh, yes, I want to know as someone that has been using the yeah the engine for twenty years, uh, did you miss something from the older versions of Unreal One, Two, and Three in this one? Uh, something that you will see, you will say. Oh God! I wish they had added here to this to Real Four. Well, in Unreal Engine Two, I think, but definitely Unreal Engine Three, you could rebuild uh, selected only, rebuild the lighting only on selected, and I think that would still be nice to have. <laughs> well, so that, that's one feature. A lot, most things are in Unreal Engine Four. So I mean, the great majority is in Unreal Engine Four, and then a million other new things. There's a few particular features. Unreal Engine One actually had some very nice stuff which was utterly bizarre, like volumetric fog in 1999. They had a procedural texture editor, which was really fun. So you had like a big, in fact, I can just show you probably while the other one is loading. So you asked for it, okay? I mean, both of you asked for it. <laughs> so I'm gonna load two different things, which takes a bit of time, but you, you'll, you'll get the idea. That's still loading. In the meantime, let me bring this up as well. So here's the original Unreal editor, which I have as well. Just to show you what happens if you wanna make textures in here. It doesn't run very well on a modern computer, so you're going to get a lot of lag, the mouse is going to skip, and it might crash. Okay? It doesn't like modern multi-core CPUs. It also keeps resetting the viewports, as you can see. Which I have to figure out how to remember this after all those years, how to get viewports back. Nope. It refuses some of these. New floating. Ah. A minute or two. Yeah, they can take the other question in the meantime. No. 
So, um, do you know what what we what we are going to to learn in our first year of our career? Like in Spanish, que vamos a tocar primero de de todo este programa. What you are going to? Uh, how are you going to begin with this program? Yeah, you mean with with this editor? O sea, con con qué vamos a empezar? Con qué vamos a empezar de de todo esto? Is, is that yeah? Where to begin? Yeah, blueprint and design. Right, so you want to see Unreal Engine 1 while the level loads. Here's Unreal Engine 1, you had actual procedure, you can clear it, and then it can, it's very small resolution as you can see, but still you can like draw lines on it and it makes like funky effects, and you can then change what it does here with all the properties. It's really bizarre, so that was 1995. So you're asking me, what do I miss? I miss making weird effects by clicking randomly around. So. Like here, spark time blaze, and you have a lot of different effects as you can see here. So you can do flocks. I'm not sure what that's going to see. Now we have flocks, see? Ooh. So, so yeah, you asked. <laughs> and the other one is still loading, by the way. So it's one more coming. I think. Not. Oh, yeah. So this is my own project that I spent uh, quite a bit of time on, three years to build. So this is 18 hours single play. This is one out of the 12 or something levels we had. Um, we hand placed everything. It's not perfect here and there. There's some issues left and right hand placing it. You know, We were a team of just seven people at the end, but a, lo a lot of it was done with fewer people. Uh, it's fully real-time lighting, day and night, uh, tornadoes, rain, hail, anything you want. You can see it can change at that time of day. Anything goes. Those big planets are actually moving. The, the tide is actually going up and down, depending on the position of the big moons. If it turns night, it actually starts to freeze. As you can see here, you got, actually, by the way, the Milky Way passing over there, which actually passes over the sky as it goes through. There is now snow on the rocks that automatically forms also on the grass. The flowers will close at night with a lot of small little tricks. If it were to start to rain while it's cold, it actually turns into snow automatically. If it is raining while the humidity is a certain percentage, it will turn in, and the temperature is a certain degree, it will turn into hail. The hail can then hit you, and so on. So I did a lot of stuff. <laughs> okay. I, I also did a lot of blueprints. I also did a lot of blueprints, and I have a lot of this stuff. This is just one of the many blueprints I have. This is a bit disorganized. It's like, don't do this at home either. This is one of them. Um, you know, and this is another one. This is the pocket computer you hold. And again, don't. I've learned from this. If I would do this again, I would do it differently. But that's not the point. The point here is, A, if you're not a programmer, you can still do, sh do stuff. And B, it actually still runs. Okay. So you can go, if you're careful and understand Blueprint, what it does, this runs, the performance of this is just fine. Uh, this is the sky, which I should have done in a more organized fashion. You can see some copy-pasting involved. Um, this is the player controller, which the controls and the sheets. This is the sheets active, and that's some random other stuff. This is the pocket computer you hold, um, right? Thing you hold in your hands all the time. And this is the player itself, and a lot of this has been collapsed because it's actually more complicated than that. For example, this one, I think, if you double click, it's a function, it does that, so there's a lot more stuff under it. Still, it should have been more optimized at C++, but the point is, you can do this, and it still works. Blueprint is not just a gimmick feature where you can buy, build small prototypes in. You can build an entire game, and provided that you pay some attention, like you will do in C++ or C Sharp as well, you can go very far. Okay? If you're careful with the ticking, and you're careful with the actor iteration and all that, you can go very far. And secondly, again, if you're not a programmer, I cannot touch a line of code, but I can do this. And that shows you the power of Blueprint. So, yes. <laughs> bueno, well, thank you very much for yeah. coming, for being here. Uh, I think it's very helpful for all of them, and for me too. <laughs> uh, 
Muchas gracias a, a todos por venir. Eh, pues, no sé si se quedarán por aquí un ratito más y que queréis hablar con ellos. Eh, si no, cualquier duda me la mandéis a mí e intentaré mandársela a ellos. Algo también manejo de esto, así que también me lo podéis preguntar a mí. <risa> ¿Vale? eh, nada, lo, eh, lo damos por finalizado. Muchísimas gracias por venir. Nos vemos en la siguiente. I just want to add very, very quick closing words. Thanks for having us. And please, if the blueprint stuff was a bit too much and boring, please take that serious because that's what will get you employed. The serious stuff, the hardcore in-depth stuff will get you employed. Same for tech art and anything else. But thank you. <laughs>